Assalamu alaikum and good evening ladies and gentlemen. I am Humaira Shakil Fasihi, the Master of Ceremony for tonight, and I am honored to welcome you all to the 16th Annual Excellence Awards Ceremony organized by CFA Society Pakistan. May I also add that gracing us today with his kind presence is the Governor of State Bank, Mr. Reza Bakr, who is also the chief guest for the evening. I would now request Mr. Faizan Ahmed to come on stage and recite a few verses from the Holy Quran. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Ar Rahman Allam Al Quran Khalaq Al Insan Allam Al Bayan الشمس والقدر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان ألا تطغوا في الميزان واقيم الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسر الميزان والأرض ووزع للأنام فيها فاكهة والنخل ذات الأكمام صدق الله العظيم Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nick Pollard, who is also the managing director of CFA Institute Asia Pacific, and was extremely enthusiastic about attending the event, has unfortunately not been able to join us today. However, he has something to say to all of us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nick Pollard. On behalf of CFA Institute, allow me to offer you a warm welcome to the 16th CFA Society Pakistan Annual Excellence Awards. I'm sorry I can't be with you tonight. I know what a joyous occasion this will be, and it's always a great pleasure to celebrate excellence in the investment industry. For those of you who don't know us, CFA Institute is the global association of investment professionals that sets the standard for professional excellence and credentials. The organization is a champion of ethical behavior in investment markets and a respected source of knowledge in the global financial community. Our aim is to create an environment where investors' interests come first, markets function at their best and economies grow. CFA Institute seeks to set professional standards for investment management practitioners and broadly engage other financial professionals through their interest and interactions with the investment management industry. Improving outcomes for investors advances our social mission and benefits members through greater demand for educated and ethical investment management professionals. We are a truly global organization with more than 168,000 CFA charter holders worldwide in 164 markets. In APAC, we have over 30,000 members growing rapidly, represented by 21 societies, including here in Pakistan, where we have 330 members, a figure which has grown by more than 50% in the last five years. Of our global candidate base, 61% hold passports from APAC countries, and more than 50% of all our candidates are now based in APAC. Pakistan is a strong contributor to that growth, with 2,649 registered candidates in 2019. Tonight's awards, which have become a much-loved feature of the investment industry in Pakistan, honor excellence in a number of different categories, including corporate finance, banking, investor relations and gender diversity. And this year, it is exciting to note that you've added a new category to recognize the best research report. We are also graced by the presence of Dr. Reza Bakir, Governor of the State Bank of Pakistan, and thank you so much for your support and for coming here this evening. At CFA Institute, 
Our motto is, let's measure up. Tonight's winners have all measured up and much more. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you for coming and have a wonderful evening. We are much thankful to Mr. Pollard's kind words. Dear audience, I'd like to draw your attention towards the cards placed on your table, if you would please. There is a live poll in which you can participate by logging into Slido and answering the questions. You may also avail the PC Hotel's free Wi-Fi facility to participate in the poll. Let me guide you with three simple sp uh, steps um, starting off with, when you go into your browser, you're going to type www.slido. Sli then you're going to enter the event code, which is 16th awards. Please keep awards A capital, 16th awards. Once you've logged in, you will see a poll in which you have to answer three questions. I will read the questions for you one by one. I'll give you some time to log in. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the first question on the screen, as you all can see. Let me read it out for you as well. When do you expect economic growth to recover to 5% and above? FI 2021, 2022, 2023, or 2024? You may see the live results on the screen. Moving on to the next question. Can you move on to the next question, please? Where do you see PKR US dollar by the end of June 2020. The options for this is 157, between 157 to 165, 165, 170, or above 170. Moving on to question number three. How soon you expect the interest rates to be in single digit? FI 2020, 2021, 2022, or after 2022? I invite all the audience to the poll. Do participate. As you all can see, the poll results are evidently clear on the screen. I'd now like to invite the president of CFS Society Pakistan and also the chief investment officer of MCBR Fabib Investments, Mr. Mohammad Asim, to share his thoughts with us. Thank you, Mera. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Honorable Governor, State Bank, distinguished guests senior professionals and colleagues of CFA Society Pakistan. I am pleased to welcome you all at the 16th Annual Excellence Award Ceremony. We are especially thankful to Honorable Chief Guest Dr. Reza Bakr, who despite his extremely busy schedule was kind enough to stand with us to recognize the better standards within the professional industry. 
Some of the distinguished guests have taken flights to join us on this pleasant evening. Please join me to greet a warm welcome to our chief guest and all the distinguished guests and yourself. Thank you very much. So this is the 16th year of CFA Society Annual Excellence Awards. This year, we are organizing this ceremony in a very unusual economic and business environment. Confidence in markets is low, and I want to highlight some very positive signs that we feel are still underappreciated by larger segments, particularly media. We have all been talking about sharp devaluation, a steep rise in interest rates, gaping hole of current account deficit and raising fiscal account with the issues of energy chain and that too in environment of FATF and IMF. And if it was not enough, a rapidly involving, evolving environment on geopolitics and global trade war. However, I think some of the positive signs that also need more discussion in larger masses as well, that include rupee now at discount to real benchmark. Our currency looks relatively more stable, particularly with more strong foreign inflows in the pipeline. Our current account deficit, though early, but better than projected, although two months readings, three months readings are not, uh, would not lead you to a right picture. But I think the, 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 the progress is much better than earlier expected. Now talking about interest rates, in a stable policy environment are down by 170 basis point. I'm sorry, I'm not announcing the monetary policy. I am just reading the secondary market yields. One of the unusual events in our history is an inverted yield curve. For 10-year bond, which a few months ago was approaching near 14% with very few ready-to-take positions and now is now trading near 12% with very few sellers in the market. Challenges are on horizon, certainly. Real and fiscal economy is still likely to struggle, but we hope that path to recovery is set, albeit a long way to go. We think negative news in such environment gets more attention than positive data points, and that's why we feel that our forum being a neutral forum should also highlight such areas. Understanding the need of our, the overall environment, CFS Society Pakistan arranged several sessions in the short span with leading economists, including Mr. Saqib Shirani, Dr. Bakar Masood Khan, and recently we hosted uh, IMF official representative to Pakistan, Ms. Teresa Deben Sanchez, to increase more interaction with markets to uh, increase, encourage two-way communication. We are working to bring more interaction with institutions like SPP to have better information and understanding in the markets. We are glad to note CFA Society became a connecting point for the fintech industry earlier. We brought the f f uh, fintech industry leaders with the state bank to discuss about the regulatory impediments that could be considered. For Ministry of Finance, recently we put up a paper based on our market research on their proposed new initiatives in the bond market. We met the SPP governor to share our views on bond dynamics in the local market. Capitalizing on our global advocacy support, we arranged a consultation for SECP on regional practices on share buyback. We connected the local mutual fund industry with the Indian industry leaders to learn about the successful practices which are increasing, which are resulting in huge growth, exponential growth in the Indian mutual fund industry. One thing that is close to our mission is help strengthening trust in market and professionals. And we are bringing in very senior professionals based in Singapore for training on ethics. We are inviting nominations from SCCP, state bank, industry associations to develop trainers on ethics so that this area continues to strengthen as well. We invited an international firm to bring international experience on financial modeling course to strengthen the technical knowledge of capital market professionals. I am pleased to share that CFA Society Pakistan is the winner of several awards at CFA Institute Community of Global Societies for our initiatives and impact on the local market. 
Today's awards are part of our efforts to appreciate better performance and higher standards to bring the best in demand. I reiterate our commitment towards making a difference in markets. In the end, I would like to appreciate the efforts of all the judges, winners, volunteers. In fact, the board members of CFL Society Pakistan are all volunteers, as you all know, and our staff in the society for sincere efforts to bring this event together. Now we move towards the most awaited speech of the evening. Dr. Raza Bakir, our chief guest, has extensive experience at many senior level in IMF and multilateral agencies. Dr. Raza is PhD in economics from California University, Berkeley, and graduate in economics from Harvard University. So may you please join me in welcoming Dr. Raza Bakir to the stage. Dr. Raza Bakir, please. Saab, thank you very much for that introduction. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be here with you today and to share with you a few thoughts before we get on with the main business of the evening, which is to recognize the awards that have been earned in the past year. Let me mention right at the very beginning that me being here with you today representing the State Bank of Pakistan is part of our strategy to reach out more to the financial community. And uh, one of our goals is that as the country navigates its way through the current economic challenges on our side at the State Bank, we want to do more communication and better communication. So we welcome suggestions that any of you may have for us, for our consideration, as how we may be able to do that more. Some of the things that we have already started recently on which we have gotten positive feedback is to meet regularly with the community of analysts as well as investors such as yourselves. And so, for instance, after our monetary policy committee meetings, we have held meetings with the analyst community we're trying to do that more regularly so you have an occasion, analysts have an occasion to hear from us how we see things when we take important decisions such as those pertaining to interest rates. In the in introduction today, I was also very curious to see the results of the polls that you had conducted, particularly when you talk about the exchange rate and you talk about the interest rate. So, what I would like to do with you today is to speak very, very briefly regarding the role that the State Bank is playing in the current economic reforms in the country. Many of these are issues that you would have heard about before. But then I also want to talk about some themes which uh, we may not have spoken about as much, but which are very dear to our minds and to our hearts, and particularly I want to speak about the work that the State Bank of Pakistan is doing on promoting financial inclusion. So let me first begin, though, with um, what are some of the key areas that the State Bank has been working on. And in big picture terms, I think you are well aware of them, but I find it helpful to recast some of those factors from a macro perspective. So let us go back six months. I think six months ago, the main question that many of the people in the financial community were talking about was that they saw that Pakistan's economy was facing several big economic challenges. The external payments, including our debt payments and import obligations, were huge. At the same time, the reserves of the country had been declining, and the earnings or the sources of new foreign exchange were limited. So a question that many of you had was, how is the country going to be able to honor its obligations? And one of the questions was also with regards to the IMF, whether or not Pakistan was going to go to the IMF. And if it was not going to go to the IMF, what was plan B? So that was the state six months ago, nine months ago, if you read the newspapers. So the first thing 
that is different today is that in our view, nobody is now questioning the ability of the country to meet its foreign obligations. One of the first things that the new economic team wanted to do was to put that tail risk, that risk off of the table. And the approach to the IMF was a part of that strategy. The IMF does not lend to countries unless it is convinced that it has good prospects of being repaid. So for us, one of the key goals and key benefits of partnering with the IMF, of course, one part of it was money that we would get at cheaper rates than we could borrow from commercial markets. But the bigger part was the signaling role, the signal that now we are working with a partner that, wouldn't norm, that does not support a country unless it can make the recommendation to its board that there are good prospects of it being repaid. So the first major development that is different from nine months ago is now at least people are not questioning with as much vigor as they were before whether the country will be able to make its foreign obligations. And this is important to recognize because this is one way in which things are different now than they were before. The second thing that I feel is different, and this now speaks to one of the questions in the poll, is about the exchange rate. Once the economic team started out on its economic reforms, one of the reforms was to change the exchange rate regime, to change it from one where the exchange rate is primarily kept fixed, it's devalued periodically, but then kept fixed at that rate, to one where it is primarily market determined. Market determined doesn't mean that there is no more room for intervention. There is. But the goal of the intervention is not to keep the rate unchanged, but the goal of the intervention is to lessen the intraday volatility in the exchange rate. But the point that I want to make to you is that if you go back three months ago, when we moved to that new exchange rate system, there was a lot of anxiety in the market. People were not sure what the new exchange rate system would be like, notwithstanding the fact that a lot of emerging market countries, probably the majority of emerging market countries have a market-based exchange rate. There was still naturally anxiety when you switch from one to the other. Many of you would have been in conversations about the potential concerns where the exchange rate might end up. So one point that I would like to bring to your attention, as was mentioned by Asim in his opening remarks, and I quote him now, saying that progress has been much better than expected I'm quoting him, not using my words, is that even at the level of the functioning of the exchange rate market, the feedback that we get from our conversations with experts in the financial sector is that things are going better than feared. The kind of numbers that people were talking about before are not being mentioned with as much frequency as they were before. The recent trends in the exchange rate is something that also was commented upon. But for us, a lot more important than the level of the exchange rate is to see how the market is functioning. And we see a, a foreign exchange market right now that has come a long way in getting used to the new system. People are buying and selling dollars. There is a lot of turnover. And interestingly, people who previously, particularly exporters or others, had concerns that the exchange rate may depreciate and therefore were waiting to bring their dollars in, are now being quite aggressive in bringing their foreign exchange in. So the second point that I wanted to mention is that even with some of the areas that were difficult three months ago, there has been progress. And in the discussions that take place, even at the level of the exchange rate, there is a level of comfort that for us is comforting. I want to tell you that financial stability in a country is a partnership. It's a partnership between the regulators and the practitioners. 
we view it as a partnership at the state bank. We are a regulator, but we want to be viewed as a partner. And we, in that endeavor, welcome feedback from any and all of you. So this is an open invitation to all of you here today that if you have suggestions for us on the issue of the exchange rate market, on issues what the state bank can do more going forward, please do and come share them uh, with us. We would be very open to your feedback. So I wanted to talk about compared to six months ago, nine months ago, there were concerns about Pakistan's external viability. Those concerns are not there now. Three months ago, there were concerns about the exchange rate market. Those concerns are a lot less now, and you have the developments in the market in front of you. What are the areas that we are working on right now? So first and foremost, central banks are very conservative. And the fact that there have been good uh, developments recently is not cause for us to suddenly relax and rest. We have to worry about risks, and that is something that we do. So while the recent strengthening in sentiment is welcome, we at the State Bank are also planning, have our own internal goals that uh, we are also prepared for risks. External shocks can come about from any source. They can come about from domestic sources. They can come about from external sources. One of our goals is to be prepared to handle such shocks as well. Another key challenge for us is inflation. Now, inflation has risen, and you would have seen in our last monetary policy statement, we had also given the range that we expect for the current fiscal year. The first and most important thing to recognize is that the rise in inflation is a consequence of the accumulated imbalances in the economy from, bef from before. Some of these accumulated imbalances had necessitated the adjustment in the exchange rate. Most people now do recognize that the exchange rate had been overvalued. So if that problem had to be addressed and the exchange rate uh, depreciated, it has an impact on the inflation rate. In addition, many of our public sector utilities were operating at tariff levels which were below those levels that would be considered fiscally prudent. So many of those prices had to be adjusted as well. So a combination of many of these factors did lead inflation to increase. Another factor was a, was a boom in consumption that took place. So the actions that the State Bank's Monetary Policy Committee has had to take to raise interest rates to bring inflation down are not actions that are pleasant, but are actions which are necessary to fight inflation. And fighting inflation is one of the core goals of the State Bank. What I want to tell you today is to have some confidence. Just as on the exchange rate side, things, according to the feedback that we get from you, things have been better than expected. Again, I quote uh, Mr. Asim. Similarly, on the inflation front, and as we mentioned and wrote in our monetary policy statement, we expect inflation to come down. Of course, there can be shocks, and we would be prepared to take action for shocks as well. But we noted in our monetary policy statement that a lot of the reasons behind the current rise in inflation are actions that were necessary to deal with the accumulated problems of the past. We wanted to take action sooner rather than later, so that sooner rather than later, people get the sense that the big decisions or actions that had to be taken are done. And when we look at the future, the delta or the change is going to be for the better rather than for the worse. So on that front as well, on inflation, we have said in our monetary policy statement that we expect inflation to be much lower in the next fiscal year than in this. 
and we expect moderation in the underlying factors that push inflation, we expect that moderation to begin around the second half of this fiscal year. So my request to you is to have confidence also that unless some unforeseen shocks come about, we also are confident that inflation is also a beast that we'll be able to tame. Now, a lot of this talk is about macroeconomic stability and about tough measures that have to be undertaken to bring stability, and that is our goal first and foremost because without stability, there is no growth. Stability is not a sufficient condition for growth. It's a necessary condition for growth, and it has to be our key focus, but it is not our only focus. And I want to talk about, therefore, what is the State Bank doing at the same time to promote growth? Some of you may or may not know, but the State Bank has facilities to try to support the provision of finance to two key sections of our economy. One is our exporters. We see the exporters community as a key ally in our efforts to bring around an economic turnaround. We have schemes that provide finance, credit at subsidized rates to exporters. There is the export refinance scheme and the long-term finance scheme. I think um, people in the industry are well familiar with these schemes. In both of these schemes, in the last fiscal year, State Bank helped to increase the provision of such credit by around 150 billion rupees. That is a lot of credit that was injected into the economy for the export-oriented sectors through the State Bank. In these schemes, there, is still, there are still buffers. And in our conversations with the exporters, we encourage them to make use of the remaining buffers in these as well. In addition to exporters, another key area of importance for us is SMEs. SME development is, in our view, a national priority. And this reason is very simple. In almost all countries in the world, SMEs account for the majority of employment generation. Same is true in the US, same is true in Pakistan, same is true in other countries. Promoting SMEs is a multifaceted agenda. One part of it is promoting finance to SMEs. State Bank got involved in it over a few years ago and has published a strategy for promoting finance to SMEs. That strategy is publicly available. We have given presentations in which we have also shared all the different schemes that the State Bank promotes for the provision of finance to SMEs. It's an area where we plan to strengthen and increase our efforts because our experience so far has been that despite an increase in the rupee amount of credit to SMEs, SME credit in share of total credit has not grown that much. And we are doing a lot of thinking on our part as to what can be done to promote the supply of such credit. There is a very big role there with regards to information asymmetries and the fact that banks, as lenders, do not have good information on borrowers, particularly in the informal sector. Another area that we struggle with is that many SMEs do not want to get documented. And if they don't want to get documented for tax or other reasons, it's very difficult for a credit provider to be able to do the due diligence to lend to them in a manner that also protects their asset quality. It's an area that is high priority to us. We welcome suggestions from the private sector as to what we can do more to promote finance to SMEs. Last but not least is the unfinished agenda with financial inclusion over and above the work that we are doing on SMEs. 
And one area where the State Bank has been doing a fair bit of work and an area that is growing very rapidly in our view is a digital payments and fintech. This is a huge potential for the country. It is a tremendous opportunity for the country not only to promote efficiency in the allocation of finance and credit, but also to promote inclusion. Probably the biggest traffic of visitors through my office, if I was to categorize one particular sector, has been related to digital payments. It's a space that is evolving very rapidly. We have been undertaking some measures to try to promote this space. It's an area where we are very keenly focused. You would be aware of some of the measures that we have already undertaken so far. And we are also planning to come up with some new things, including holding an event with the key industry stakeholders to get their feedback on what the State Bank needs to do to further develop the frameworks that we offer for digital payments and for fintech more broadly. I just want to mention that this is an area that is not important just in itself because it promotes inclusion, but it's also an area that I want to end on which is very important for the State Bank as well, and that is gender diversity. Digital payments also offers a possibility that the gap that exists in participation in the financial sector between men and women can be reduced. Our early experience with promoting this, particularly for accounts for women, has been very promising. And we feel that it's an area where as we push this further, not only is it going to be beneficial in its own accord, it is also going to be very helpful for promoting gender diversity and access of finance, particularly for our women in general, but also women entrepreneurs who may right now not have as good access to finance as men do. I was particularly I, would partic I was particularly happy to see also that in today's awards, there is, a there is a specific area also for recognizing gender diversity. Let me conclude in terms of the thoughts that I wanted to share by noting that look back nine months ago, see where we are now. There were some big risks that everybody was talking about. Look at three months ago, there were some concerns that people rightly had. We've made progress in addressing those risks. We at the State Bank are very confident that adhering to the reform program that has been identified is going to continue to deliver better and better news. And for our part, we are ready to continue to implement the program and also to deal with the shocks and the risks that may come about. So finally, let me say that I'm very much looking forward to the award ceremony, looking forward to congratulating those of you who are going to be recognized this evening, to remind you that your excellence, your continued hard work uh, is helpful to us and it's helpful towards building a better and stronger financial sector, which continues to be one of our key goals. So thank you very much for this opportunity to share a few thoughts with you. I believe I'm supposed to uh, try to address some questions, which I would be happy to do so. And then I'm looking forward to participating in the award ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bakir. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be taking questions through Slido. You can post your questions 
uh, through Slido. The login details have already been shared with you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, while uh, uh, the audience is, uh, is uh, logging in and posting their questions, I would also like to add one thing that there are already few questions there. And if you feel a question represents your question, you can just like it. And the more likes it gets, it gets populated up on the charts. So we will have more relevant questions, which more audience is trying to ask. So until uh, uh, the question gets populated here, uh, I'll just open the floor uh, with your permission, sir. Uh, so since uh, you have sounded a beat on economy in recent statements, and uh, I have also taken a cue from you as well, uh, with FX and monetary side now looking to be moving towards relative stability, relative improvement, when do you see, in your view, based on your experience of working in different markets, and as an economist, you think, how long can it take the real economy to start resuming and bouncing back? We have been looking at the negative readings on the LSM index as well. Thank you. I think that's probably the most critical question, which is when do we expect a turnaround in the real economy? So let me share with you our thoughts on how we see developments. There are two things in our view that are going on that are conceptually different. The first is the measures that were undertaken to try to deal with the current account deficit. This had to do with the exchange rate, but this also had to do with the interest rates and a few other actions. They include, for instance, also the actions that were taken on the fiscal side to deal with the large fiscal deficit. All of these actions whether they are a tightening of monetary, of monetary policy or a tightening of fiscal policy, they work to bring down aggregate demand. So there is an overall series of actions taken on that front. But at the same time, there is a shift in the composition of activity. And that is very important to recognize. And this shift has to do with the movement in the exchange rate. As we have tried to argue, previously when the exchange rate was fixed. It was de facto a tax on exporters and it was de facto a subsidy on importers. One way to look at what's happened on the exchange rate is that that tax has been removed on exporters and the subsidy that importers were getting has been removed. So there is a shift today on the exporter side, particularly textiles, volumes are growing. They have been growing. And you mentioned the current account reading of the past two months. In our analysis and in the analysis that we have shared in various fora, the improvement in the current account is not over the last two months. It has been a steady improvement over at least the past one year. And what is reassuring is that that movement begins once the real exchange rate begins to adjust. So we see that export-oriented sectors are doing better than domestically-oriented sectors. But for economists, this is also what you would expect when the real exchange rate begins to reflect the underlying market forces. So we see a shift in composition, but we also see that while exports are leading right now, there is a time that comes sooner or later when the improvement in the sentiment does lead to an improvement in domestic-oriented industries as well. Now, when that improvement comes, is entirely in your hands because you are also the market participants. We, when we say that things are getting better, we can say that and we can substantiate that with numbers 
as we try to do at the State Bank whenever I am asked to give a presentation somewhere. But ultimately, the measure of our success in communication is when you, based upon your analysis, feel that the worst case scenarios that you had thought of are not there anymore. And that you feel that on the margin, the news is more better than worse. It is still early. In other countries that I've worked on, it takes months before there is a turnaround in sentiment that people can bank on. We are prepared for that. The point that I wanted to make is that we should take some encouragement from the positive developments that have already occurred, and we should not doubt the resilience of the economy to be able to deal with the challenges that it faces. I, at my level, when I first saw the situation and the imbalances, I am very confident based upon what I have seen over the last two months that by adhering to the reform program that the turnaround will come sooner rather than later. Thank you, sir. Uh, until now, the most uh, asked question by majority of people is uh, they're looking for clarity on FATF. Maybe you want to comment on that. Uh. So I should tell you that um, on uh, FATF, there, there are several things that are happening. But there, we had most recently a delegation that had gone to Bangkok that was led by our federal minister, Mr. Hamad Azhar. And he also is leading a task force that has been created to address the areas identified in this area. The Ministry of Finance has already issued uh, a statement in the press regarding what was achieved over there. So that is with you. I think what I could perhaps usefully do is to share with you a little bit of background as to what are the two parallel streams of work that are happening because there is the FATF and a few weeks ago there was also the APG meetings that took place in Canberra which I led. And I warn you that this is a very technical area. I myself when I had, when I was asked by, when I was asked to lead the delegation myself had to learn a lot about all the different fora that have been created in this in this field. So FATF is a global task force, the Financial Action Task Force. That task force has regional bodies underneath it. There are nine such regional bodies. They are called FSRBs, FATF-style regional bodies. APG, the Asia Pacific Group, is one of those nine regional bodies. Pakistan is a member of APG. All members of a regional body undergo what is called a mutual evaluation. And the visit that took place to Canberra was with regards to the mutual evaluation of Pakistan. Now, what happens in the normal course of events is that when a country and all members of a regional body undergo the evaluation, when that evaluation is done, and if it is the case that concerns are identified in that evaluation, the enhanced effective follow-up, then the regional body, APD, bumps up that country to the global task force and says that this country needs to be dealt with at that level. In Pakistan, Pakistan was already being dealt with by the global task force and was already on the gray list. So as a consequence of the APG meeting, nothing additional is gonna happen because what could have happened, i.e. a country being put on the gray list, had already happened because there is one, there is a parallel way to get onto the gray list which is by nomination, which was the case for Pakistan. 
So there are two parallel things. One is the progress, the assessment of the progress that Pakistan is making on the FATF action plan. The second is the action that will be taken by Pakistan to address the areas identified in the mutual evaluation report from the meetings in Canberra in APG. Now this is a unique situation in uh, FATF. No country has ever been in these two processes simultaneously. And we will get further clarity on how Pakistan will go forward after the meetings that are to take place in October in the FATF plenary. But one thing that I can tell you is that the pace of progress in addressing the areas identified by both the FATF as well as the regional body APG, that pace of progress has increased very significantly, very significantly over the last few months. And that increase in the pace of implementation has also been recognized by key stakeholders who assess Pakistan. The actual assessment, we can't prejudge because that is for the assessors to do. But there has been significant progress of the pace with which Pakistan has been making progress in these areas. Thank you, sir. I think we can draw a positive stance from you on this side as well. Uh, now the next area is about uh, the opening up of uh, local debt markets to foreign investors, and there have been a lot of efforts. We have recently heard about, read about uh, ECC approving a lower tax bracket for foreign investors on 10 instruments in Pakistan as well. Now, there have been concerns in the market as well, and that's actually one of the questions is that uh, that Pakistan, country like Pakistan, which does not have cushion in reserves. So this hot capital, do you think that Pakistan, is, is it a good, source of capital for Pakistan where the environment particularly and just for instance the geopolitical situation gets uh, uh, volatile. So in this kind of environment do you think this this will bring the needed stability to the overall foreign exchange outlook of Pakistan? So let me share with you this is a very important question so I'm glad you raised it and let me share with you the goals of the changes that are envisioned in this area. To share with you the goals of uh, these changes, I need to take you a step back. And uh, we need to talk a little bit about the broader category of portfolio investment by non-residents in Pakistan. Since you, are, since you are participants in the market, I don't need to tell you that um, historically, Foreign portfolio investment in Pakistan has primarily concentrated on equities. And Pakistan has received very, very large amounts of investment from non-resident companies into our stock market. You would know that very well. So the first point to note is that is also hot money. Okay? That issue has never, the hotness of that money has never been discussed before, but it is portfolio investment, just like portfolio investment in debt. And in fact, uh, people will tell you that if you take a very long period of time, foreign investors in dollar terms have made very handsome returns on the Pakistani stock market. That experience has entailed that money leaving the country as well. Okay? And so that when that money has left the country, it has also been an organized process that has not led to problems. Now, the goal of the intended changes is to try to deepen our debt capital markets and to try to address this asymmetry that while our equity markets have benefited a lot from foreign capital inflows, our debt markets have not. So the question is, what would be the benefits from that? 
Taking into account the size of Pakistan's local debt market, I think one area which will help with the provision of sources of long-term finance for clients, for borrowers, is to have a yield curve that has deep pockets along the curve, especially at the longer ends. You would know that right now we have a number of scattered issues along the yield curve. And it's not rocket science to talk about the benefits of developing deep liquid pockets along the curve, three years, five years, seven years, 10 years. As you do that, and as the market has that deep pockets with a lot of turnover and liquidity, that can be the pools of finance that are available to banks as well as other firms to be able to provide longer term credit to clients. Foreign participation can help deepen that market. Okay? So, so one overall goal from these intended changes is to deepen the markets. Second is the clarification. The intended changes de facto do not actually reduce the tax rates. And that is why it is being pitched as a simplification of the tax system for them. Let me explain to you why. Because of double taxation treaties, because of tax treaties that Pakistan has with a number of countries, most of the jurisdictions from which these funds will emerge are countries that already have such tax treaties. The tax rate in these treaties is in the roughly in the 8 to 13 percent or something of that range. But tax treaties are somewhat complicated and for foreign investors, especially considering the negative perceptions of Pakistan in international media, they already have concerns coming into a country like Pakistan. There are a lot of rewards to having a taxation regime in this area, which is simple. And so one of the key goals is not to de facto reduce the rate from what it may be, but rather to make a tax regime that is simple and one that is full and final. One of the most common feedbacks that I have gotten from foreign investors in the countries that I've worked on is that they prefer a tax regime where it's very clear to them upfront how much will be the tax that will be deducted at source when they want to take the money out. And that is what we are trying to do. The second thing is that currently, if you buy treasury bills, the withholding tax is around 10%. But if you buy bonds and you have capital gains, the tax rate is higher. So there is a little bit of a bias or an incentive towards treasury bills. If you want to promote longer term finance, you want to level the playing field. And so one of the intended goals is also to simply level the playing field between shorter term and longer term and therefore encourage more inflows on the longer end. And finally, it can help with reserves. And to address your question about money leaving, it is a correct observation that capital flows, uh, particularly portfolio flows, are a function of many factors, some of which pertain to world interest rates. And in working in other countries, I have seen cases where when world interest rates go up, some capital can flow out. But the point I want to make is that you cannot lose what you don't have. If capital flows out, only that will flow out that came in. Right now, we hardly have anything in terms of non-residence investments in the debt markets. So suppose non-residents do begin to invest in our debt markets, and suppose if global interest rates rise, some of them do leave. What will go out will be a fraction of what came in. And we are prepared, just as we are prepared in other areas as well, 
to be able to manage inflows and outflows, especially taking into account that the state bank and the economic authorities have dealt with portfolio outflows from the stock market without major issues. So I want to focus more not on the immediate benefit that may come about, but really from the deepening of the capital market that we think is something that will help the country. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just back to differ with respect to fundamental difference, again, comparing equity, foreign portfolio investment flows, and debt market flows. Equity investor obviously has more risk appetite, will double down, but the fixed income investor would most likely shy away from taking, putting risk at, uh, putting the capital at risk, and maybe the first one to react and uh, lose away. Uh, uh, again, that's that's uh, just one observation that I had. Uh, now I'll I'll come to the next question, and I'll just try to merge two three questions and try to 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 make one case. Uh, it's about inflation trajectory, interest rates, and growth. Uh, so first of all, uh, again, a lot of people have asked, uh, keeping interest rates high for too long a time. How would stability return? How would uh, the growth come? How would industries uh, be encouraged? And secondly, where inflation is, is a mainly uh, uh, a cost push phenomena uh, rather than uh, a monetary phenomena. Again, that's a view generally people have in our economy. And uh, again, with regards to inflation, uh, the CPI base has recently been uh, CPI has been rebased recently, and that has changed the inflation estimates as well. Now, as we had earlier higher estimates, uh, would you like to share uh, the estimates now as we has the, for the inflation going forward? And uh, again, a related question uh, with regards to that: how 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 would you respond to a lower inflationary environment? Would you immediately consider to? Uh, uh, change your stance on the monetary policy or how, how the transition should happen from a tighter monetary policy to a losing monetary policy. So I know that no conversation with the governor of a central bank can be complete without talking about interest rates and inflation outlook. So this is uh, anticipating that question. I'm surprised it took that long to ask me that question. However, I am also unfortunately going to disappoint you. And um, I feel that I must disappoint you, especially today, because as you know, we have the MPC schedule for Monday. So for me to speak right now would uh, be particularly inappropriate considering how close that meeting is. I think our last views on uh, the outlook for inflation and interest rates were in the last monetary policy statement, which I presume you all read. And, uh, in that statement, we also shared our forecast for inflation for this fiscal year. So I ask you to kindly hold your question until uh, we have the MPC. And um, I don't know if there are any analysts here, but we are also going to be having the usual meeting with the analysts after the MPC. And so we would welcome your questions then. But for the sake of clarity of communication, and to preserve and strengthen the institution of the Monetary Policy Committee, I think we should uh, not discuss interest rates right now. With regards to the CPI base, uh, so this was something that was in train. As you know, the CPI numbers are not produced by the State Bank. We are a user of those numbers, just like you are you would also have seen the communication from um, the communication that took place when the new CPI numbers were released. I think what I would uh, ask you to focus on is that the government, the Bureau, is going to be publishing the two series. And I think that is a welcome step in the interest of transparency, that you will have ample opportunity to look at the new series and the old series, and to see and to get comfortable with it. On our part, we are doing the same. We are in the process of analyzing the data that we have gotten access to with the new CPI. We are going to be running our models on the new CPI. 
and in due course, once we have completed our analysis, we'd be happy to share with you our thoughts on the new CPI as well. I'll only come back to the bigger picture issue and the longer term point that I made with regards to the outlook for inflation is that many of the reasons why inflation is high right now is because of the need for the actions that had to be taken to address the imbalances that were accumulated from before. We wanted to get that out sooner rather than later. Therefore, as we said in our monetary policy statement, we expect inflation in the next fiscal year to be much less than in this fiscal year. Thank you, sir. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask last one question uh, with regards to overall savings rate. Savings rate with respect to GDP, uh, again, uh, in the overall context, uh, it, it's been repeatedly highlighted that this is uh, one of the chronic issues, the structural issues the Pakistan market has. Uh, so, so, so are there any ideas in pipeline, any steps in pipeline or areas where you see that can spur a real activity in terms of improving the overall savings rate, which again has implications for investment and liquidity in markets? Yeah, I think this is one of the key areas, um, but I would say not only is it saving, you know, it's also private investment. Because if you look at private investment, that has remained flat for a very long period of our history. And in fact, if you look at the correlation with interest rates and so forth, it, there is some correlation, but not a very, very strong correlation, which seems to suggest that there are many structural factors that underlie the fact that private investment in Pakistan is not where it should be. Savings is a very big part of our agenda as well. Um, the agenda that we have on financial inclusion, the agenda that we have on digital banking, on digital payments, I think will go towards helping <coughs> uh, with that goal. I think more broadly, the drive to document the economy that is ongoing right now, and we are beginning to feel some of it, will also help. And finally, we want to work with banks to see also what can be done to make saving instruments more attractive for the savers. I think there is a lot more than can be done right now by working with banks to attract the pools of cash that are sitting outside and not being put in the banking system. Thank you, sir. I think that that's, uh, uh, concludes our Q&A. And uh, I'm really thankful and grateful for your uh, comments here. I'm sure the markets would have a much better understanding and much better guidance. And I'm sure uh, this will also go, this, this process will continue as you already mentioned that you are opening up. And uh, we are really thankful. Uh, we will now begin the Excellence Award ceremony with, the, uh, with your permission. Thank you, Ji. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Riza Bakar. That was a very insightful session that we just had. I'd also request you to stay back for the awards ceremony that we're going to have now. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the part of the night which you'll all have been very excited about has just approached. Uh, we are going to be starting off with uh, the first category of award, which is basically an award that was won uh, for Investment Ideas Award. Um, it's from the last year, and the winner for this particular category is Mr. Mohammed Suhail, CEO of Topline Securities. May I please have you here, sir? Sir, would you please do the honors? May I just add that he has won a cash prize for this criteria where uh, anyone who made the most accurate forecast on the provided questions was to be awarded. I would, at this point in time, invite you all to also be a part of this Investment Ideas Award competition. You have the sheets on the questionnaires on your desk. You can uh, answer them and then leave at the desk before you leave. Thank you.
For the next category of awards, I'd like to invite CFS Society's board members one by one. Um, starting off with the banking awards, I'd like to request Mr. Raza Jafri, CFA, to please come on stage. Thank you. I'll just quickly take you through um, the bank's awards. Um, first up, uh, the judges committee uh, was comprised of CFA charter holders. Uh, this was a committee of three people. Uh, this is Mr. Asif Ali Qureshi, uh, Mr. Farooq Karim Khan, and Mr. Sayyid Suleiman Akhtar. And the volunteers for this award uh, were Mr. Rohit Kumar and Mr. Yushra Beg. And the five ca categories are uh, large banks, medium banks, small banks, Islamic banks, and Islamic window. And the awards are based purely on 2018 financials. Uh, the criteria of the awards, as with prior years, has been profitability, efficiency, growth, and solvency. Uh, but one key difference um, is that, uh, you know, for the first time, we've got Bank Al-Habib and Bank Al-Fala categorized as large banks, so just bear that in mind. Um, so without further ado, we're going to move into the awards part of the, uh, of this, uh, of the banking awards. So the first category is the best Islamic window for 2018. And the runner up for this award, for this category, is Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, may I please have the CEO of Standard Chartered Bank, Mr. Shazad Dada, up on stage, please. Staying with the same category, uh, we move to the winner of the best Islamic window for 2018. Uh, and this is Bank Al Habib. Uh, could we please have Mr. Asad Ali Habib, Ali Asad Habib, the regional head of Islamic banking, on stage, please? Next category is the best Islamic bank for 2018. So the previous one was for the windows. This is for the best Islamic bank for 2018. The runner up uh, for this year is Mizan Bank. Could we please have the, the chief risk officer, Sayyid Tariq Hassan Saab, please? for the winner of the best Islamic bank for 2018. Uh, this is Dubai Islamic Bank. Uh, could we please have the CEO, Mr. Junaid Ahmed, up on stage? to the conventional bank space. Um, and the first uh, award category in this space is the best small bank for 2018. Uh, the runner up for this year is ICBC Pakistan. Could we please have the deputy CEO, Mr. Edmund, up on stage, please, if he's here.
offer the winner of the uh, best small bank for 2018. This is Citibank. Could we please have uh, Ms. Sara Siddiqui, Vice President City Markets, up on stage, please. sized uh, category so for the best medium sized bank for 2018 the runner up is Habib Metropolitan Bank could we please have Mr. Mohsen Nathani up on stage uh, the president and CEO Winner for the best medium sized bank for 2018 is Standard Chartered. Mr. Shazad Dada, sir, please. For the final um, banking awards uh, category, this is large banks. Uh, the runner up for the best large bank for 2018 is Bank Al Habib. Uh, Mr. Mansoor Ali Khan, uh, the CEO of Govern Stage, please. for the banks um, is the winner of the best large bank for 2018 and this is Allied Bank. Could I please have Mr. Ahmed Fahim Khan, the chief of the Treasury Awards we transition to the other category now. Thank you. Thank you, Rasa. Moving on to the next awards are corporate finance and investor relations, for which I'd like to invite Mrs. Satish uh, Balani to do the honors. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Initially, I would like to uh, introduce our judges who, uh, who are part of the committee who evaluated all the transactions within corporate finance for the corporate finance awards. We had Mr. Farideh Khan, uh, Mr. Sir Muhammad Ali, and uh, Mr. Shahzad Saleem. And the volunteers uh, included Osama Ibrahim, CFA, Bilal Khan, and myself. Uh, moving on to the uh, description of the criteria. So uh, we... Uh, we had four main major, primarily four categories uh, under corporate finance. Uh, first one is, was the fixed income category where we evaluated different transactions, different uh, corporate houses uh, on the basis of their number of transactions uh, 
uh, value of transactions and complexity, and the similar criteria was followed for equity transactions as well. But we have two uh, awards within that category. There's banking uh, award for equity transactions, and there's NBFC's uh, award category. And we had a fourth award, which is Transaction of the Year Award, uh, which was based on innovation, size, width of distribution, and impact of Pakistan financial markets. And uh, so moving on to the awards, which is the most important part. So first category is uh, Corporate Finance uh, House of the Year, runner-up fixed income. And the award goes to UBL Bank. For, the, for taking the award, I would like to invite Mr. Saeed Iqbal, uh, Group Head Investment Banking, UBL. Uh, winner in this category is HBL Bank. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Usman Hamid, Head of Project Finance. Our next category is uh, equities, uh, best corporate finance house of the year, equity banks. And the uh, runner-up is Bank al -Fala. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Ali Sultan, Group Head Treasury and Capital Markets. Now, uh, winner in this category is uh, UBL. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Saeed Iqbal again uh, to receive the award. Moving on to the next category, it's Best Equity House of the Year within NBFCs. Uh, and runner-up is Topland Securities. I would like to invite Mr. Uh, Mohamed Sohail, CEO of Topland Securities. category is RF Habib Limited. I would like to invite the CEO, uh, Mr. Shahid Ali Habib. is Transaction of the Year 2018, and the award goes to JS Global Capital uh, for AGP, Private Li AGP Limited uh, IPO. I would like to invite Mr. Kamran Nasser to receive the award. It's Investor Relations Award. Uh, this award is basically uh, on the basis of uh, companies uh, holding an analyst briefing, how they uh, manage their investor relations, and uh, it's poll-based. Uh, we our respondents were 40 in the survey, uh, which were different CIOs, investment managers, and head of research of different companies. Uh, and the runner-up uh, for this award is uh, Engro Corporation. I would like to invite Mr. Farooq Barkat Ali, VP Finance from the company.
category and uh, that goes to Bank Alfala. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Ali Sultan to Group Head Treasury and Capital Markets to receive the award. And it's the sixth time the bank is winning this award. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Satish. Ladies and gentlemen, the next category is not only vitally crucial in maintaining balance as workplace, it also highlights that Pakistan too has equal opportunity employers who are acknowledging the role of women in building the society by creating gender diversity within their organization. I'd like to request Sadaf Shabir to come over here and talk about it. Assalamu alaikum. These awards are relatively new, running in its third year now. We are encouraged to see the increasing level of participation <clears throat> with 27 submissions this year. Our esteemed judges panel include Ms. Aisha Aziz, Ms. Naz Khan, Kavar Saeed, and myself. Asma Mamda and Huraina Asif were our valuable volunteers for the award. The criteria for the awards include a mix of quantitative and qualitative factors. The goal is not only to see the proportion of women in the workforce, but to judge the seniority of the roles as well. We have not included the previous year's winner in the awards to increase our outreach. At the same time, we acknowledge that they remain the true leaders of the industry in this aspect, and we thank them for their participation and support. Our past winners include Unilever, Racket, National Foods, Habi Bank, and Alphala Investments. Now to announce the winners of 2018, we have three categories, corporates, banks, and NBFIs. The award for corporates goes to Khadi Pakistan. I would like to request the HR team to step up on the stage for the award. Chartered Bank. I would request Mr. Shaisa Dada to come up on the stage. Pakistan. I would like to invite Farwa Hasnan to come up on the stage to receive the award. For those of you who are not familiar with Karandas, it's a not-for-profit entity with the aim to promote access to finance for micro setups and SMEs. Thank you, Sadaf. Um, Dear all, we've reached the final two categories for the night. 
uh, starting off with research reports and then brokerage awards, uh, respectively for which I request Mr. Mohammed Asim to do the honors. Within the brokerage industry, we have uh, this year a new award. Uh, that is the Research Report Award of the Year. And that's been uh, decided by the uh, committee of uh, CFA Society Pakistan members that included, uh, judges included Farid Ahmed Khan, Sayyid Suleiman Akhtar, Taha Javed, Sayyid Akbar Ali, Sanam Zeb and Farooq Karim Khan. And the volunteers included at Raza Ahmed Farooqi. Uh, the criteria included quality of estimates, the presentation of reports, and uh, I am very pleased to announce the runner-up is uh, EFG Hamas Pakistan. Uh, the senior management of EFG Hamas, including the CEO and the whole team, is uh, doing a great job in London. They are engaging with investors, uh, foreign investors, and doing a roadshow. And we are really glad to have uh, Jawad Shami from the research of EFG Hamas to collect the award. The winner is, uh, for the best research report of the year, is Optimus Capital. I'd invite uh, representative from Op Optimus Capital, Faizan, uh, would you like to please come on the stage? Brokerage Industry Awards, the Equity Brokerage Industry. This is mainly a survey-based award where we engage with more than 60 institutions who have voted, managing more than 700 billion rupees uh, AUM invested in equity markets. Uh, and uh, the survey is, uh, is, is uh, sent out to these institutions where portfolio managers, research uh, analysts, and head of research, and uh, uh, the investment team actually decides and votes uh, from, uh, 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 from each institution. Uh, the first uh, category in this award is the economic research house, is the best economic research house of the year. And the runner up for this award is uh, EFG Hermes Pakistan. <laughs> Economic uh, Research House of the Year Award goes to JS Global Capital, and I would like to invite uh, uh, the Head of Research, uh, Hussain Heather, to please come on the stage. Best Equity Trader of the Year. And the runner up of it goes to Nazim Abdul Muttalib from Smile Iqbal Securities. Nazim, please come on the stage. The winner for the best equity trader of the year is for Farhan Rizvi from JS Global Capital. Uh, of 
the year award and the runner up is uh, Tahir Abbas from Arif Aviv Limited. Equity analyst for the year goes to Arsalan from JS Global Capital. Concluding award of the evening, and that is the best equity brokerage house of the year. The runner up is EFG Hamas Pakistan. equity brokerage house for the year goes to JS Global Capital. I'll request Kamran Nasser to please come on the stage. This concludes the Equity Brokerage Award. And now I would request uh, Hurena to please uh, call upon the board members. Um, I'd like to request the CFA Society Pakistan's board members to please come on the stage. Uh, we would uh, want to give uh, present a memento to our kind uh, honorable chief guest here tonight. All board members, please, to join us. I would also request the volunteers and the judges to join in for a group photograph. Would the judges please join in for the group photograph? Thank you, along with the volunteers. Um, ladies and gentlemen, while we take the photograph, uh, you are free to proceed towards dinner. Uh, this uh, is the final concluding remark for the evening. I hope you had a great time and uh, please enjoy the dinner. Thank you.